written thousands of years ago. Every page, every story inspired from God. Do they apply to me? Is the Old Testament obsolete? With Pastor Jim Scudder, Jr. One of the things that I hate in life is obsolescence. The reason is because I feel like I'm getting there myself. Fortunately, we have a little bit of money to spend on the grandkids, or maybe they might think we were obsolete. I don't know. We have our staff at our ministries here at the church and at the the media ministries, and they'll always tell me, well, pastor, we need this new equipment. Didn't we just buy that, that computer? Yeah, two years ago. Like, well, why can't we keep using it? Well, it's obsolete. And their favorite phrase is, pastor, they don't support it anymore. <laughs> well, then you support it, and let's just keep using it. <laughs> Things go out of style, out of use, so fast. Today, it makes your head spin. We have a couple things on this table that I would consider obsolete, or certainly going obsolete. Some of you are really dying to find out what it is under there, aren't you? Yes. So what I'm gonna need is, I'm gonna need a kid. So we have, a, we have children's programs here uh, during church, but we have some of the older kids uh, still in here. So any of you kids wanna volunteer? Raise your hand if you wanna volunteer, and I'll, I'll pick one of you and um, we'll have you come up. So raise your hand and hold it up high if you want to volunteer. By the way, I'm going to give you 20 bucks uh, to help me. Oh, there's a hand. Okay, come on up. Come on up. I knew, I knew that little incentive would help. Okay, so come on up here, and we're going to unveil what's under the table. Okay, give that to that guy over there. There we go. All right, now, isn't this cool? What's your name? Nathan. Okay, Nathan, can you tell me what these two things are? First of all, what is this? A phone. Yeah, or but... A telephone. What kind of phone? I don't know. Okay, so <laughs> if I would tell you to call the number, would you be able to dial it? No. Okay, try it. Would you call 847? <laughs> you have no idea what to do, do you? No idea. Yeah, I'm telling you. Weren't these great? And then my dad... He was always on the phone in our house, so he had these long cords. It was probably like three times the length of this one. So, yeah, well, most people don't even have, how many of you still have a landline in your house? Raise your hand. A few of you do. Most, most of us don't, I, we don't have a landline. And so, yeah, I mean, even, even landlines, they're telling us that you can't get them anymore. So it's all coming over, over the internet. So this is a telephone, so how you would do it is you would dial, if I, you want to dial eight, you put your finger in the eight and you go all the way around to there. Now listen. Isn't that cool? Yeah. yeah. So you do the next one, four. Yeah. And then once you get all the way done, you'll find out you dialed the wrong number. Okay, so what is this? Okay, what kind of projector? I don't know. Yeah. Do you know what this is? Here, hold this. You know what that is? A film. It is. So this is called a slide. And then this is called a slide projector. See how advanced we were back then when we decided to... This, and this really was pretty high technology. Um, you could, when you had a camera, and the cameras used to have film inside. I know I've lost you. But... <laughs> You can have them developed into pictures or into slides. And your relatives would always get the slides. And they'd invite you over to watch their vacation. <laughs> click, click, and about after the third click, you're asleep. So this was actually a great way to fall asleep. So if you hold this up into the light, you can see, tell me what that is. Here, hold it, and hold it up into the light and tell me if you can tell what that is. A dog. Yeah, so it's, it's a picture of a dog. And uh, you'd, you'd have them in here, and you'd have to make sure they're in right. Remember that? I'd always have them in wrong. 
and you'd have a little clicker, and it was just crazy. But, you know, this was state-of-the-art, and so was this. I mean, there was a time that, that you didn't have the ability to talk to people over distance, you know? So these, these things in their day were cutting edge, but now, unfortunately, they're obsolete. Okay, so I promised you 20 bucks. By the way, this is going obsolete too. Give them a hand. Here. What I'd like for you to do to help me in this sermon series is the Old Testament obsolete. I want you to bring in some things that you know what it is, but your kids or grandkids might not, okay? From your house, from your experience, uh, and every Sunday we'll have one item there and we'll have a kid come up and tell us if they can uh, figure out what it is, okay? So that's your assignment, that's how you'll be part of my sermon and I will tell people uh, who, who brought these items in. And I know one was uh, Patty Costello is the slide projector and the rotary phone I believe was Ann Rust, okay? So uh, we thank them. Uh, you can, by the way, have your items back uh, we're not starting a museum here, but it certainly does prove a point. With that said, we have something that is very, very old. Thousands of years ago, this book was finished, and it's still relevant today. Isn't that amazing? How is it that this ancient book can still tell me how to raise my kids, how to treat my neighbors, how to treat my wife. How is it that, that this book isn't obsolete? Now, some people say it is, but let me tell you what the Bible says. The Bible says in Isaiah 40, verse 8, the grass withereth, the flower fadeth, but the word of God shall stand forever. Isn't that wonderful? This is incredible. This book will never go obsolete. Amen? It's a marvelous, marvelous thing. In Psalm 111, at verse 7, it says, The works of his hands are verity and judgment. His commands, uh, commandments are sure. They stand fast, look, forever and ever, and are done in truth and uprightness. This book is a book that is from God. And God is the one who created us, and he's also outside of time. So he knows what he's talking about when it comes to us, and he also, since he's outside of time, the things that he tells us are timeless. And so this book should be precious to you. This book should be so important to you into your life. But since we have a big chunk of this book that we call Old, in its title, Old Testament, two-thirds of this book are what we call the Old Testament. Because we use the word old for this half, or this two-thirds almost, of the Bible, then we are, are assuming that we don't need it anymore, or it's not relevant anymore. It's old, and, and all we need is the, the New Testament, okay? Now, why do we call it the Old Testament and the New Testament? Well, because Jesus taught us about a New Testament, but he did not teach us that this was irrelevant, uh, unnecessary, we don't need to learn it, we don't need to know it. And what I'm going to do today and in this series, and this is going to be a long Sunday morning sermon series at Quentin Road Baptist Church, we're going to be taking a New Testament passage that references the Old Testament, and we're going to jump back and learn what that was that happened, and that's going to show light on the New Testament. I actually prefer to call the Old Testament the Hebrew Scriptures because they were almost all written in Hebrew and all, almost all of the New Testament written in Greek. 
So I prefer to call it the Hebrew Scriptures, and we could call this the New Testament. But just because we call it the Old Testament doesn't mean it's not relevant. And there are some popular preachers in America that are minimizing the Old Testament. And I believe that's wrong. We need to know what it says. They, they, they say, we just need to focus on Jesus. We just need to focus on the resurrection. And believe me, we do need to focus on Jesus and the resurrection. That should be the very first thing, the foundational thing of our faith. But Jesus references the Old Testament over 80 times, as recorded in the Gospels. The Old Testament is referenced by authors of the New Testament either by quotation or by allusion, 900 times. You cannot get what God wanted for us, what God wanted to convey to us reading the New Testament without knowing the Hebrew Scriptures. This is so important that we know what the Old Testament says. And obviously, my question and my series title, Is the Old Testament Obsolete? You obviously know what I think about that, right? Now, there is a balance. We're going to talk about the balance. Some people will overemphasize the Old Testament, and we cannot do that either. We cannot live under law. We are living in a new day, in a new dispensation. But there's 300 direct quotes of the Old Testament in the New Testament. Almost 900 times there's an an allusion or a quote from the Old Testament to the New Testament. And by the way, you remember Jesus said, I did not come to destroy the law, but what? To fulfill it. To fulfill it. So in this series, we're going to read something from the New Testament, and that's going to give us a springboard to jump back into that story, and we're going to try to cover a lot of the major episodes. They're incredible, amazing stories, truly. Uh, you saw in our opening sequence, in our opening uh, video, it's, those were clips from Patterns of Evidence. They gave us permission. Timothy Mahoney is a friend of ours, gave us permission to use those clips. But when you can kind of see the animation of what some of those things look like, it's just astounding. And I hope that one day we can actually see those events. You think God has the ability to show us uh, what it was like to part the Red Sea. I mean, Cecil B. DeMille's told us, but not, I mean, you know, as good as Hollywood could back then. But it's just, I mean, if you were to be able to be there and see it, I, I think that, of course, God has that ability. And it won't be slide projectors. It won't be VHS. You don't know what that is. Uh, it won't be uh, high-definition video, 16 by 9 format. I think God has some, like, total immersive way for us to go back and, and check out some of those things. And, and that would be a, a blast, wouldn't it, to see the Red Sea part, or uh, I mean, think, of, think of the things that you'd like to see, and, and start asking the Lord now that you could be first in line for that, that experience. So this is going to be an exciting series. I'm looking forward to, to teaching it. What I want to do is explain a little bit about something that's called dispensationalism. This is a, a, a doctrine, and this is a doctrine I hold to. It's a doctrine that our church holds to, and we would call ourselves traditional dispensationalists. Now, if you're starting to like, oh, okay, here it comes. Here comes the boring part. No, wait, 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 wait. Remember, everything in the Bible is exciting. Everything, okay? Look at Hebrews 1.1. 1, 1. God who at sundry times and in divers manners spake. Now you say, wait a second. What did you just say? What does that mean, sundry divers? Well, you know, many of you know that we use the King James. You say, why would you use the King James? It's such an old-fashioned uh, version of the Bible. The reason I use it is because it is tried and true. It's the only Bible version in the English language that doesn't use at all the critical text, which I oppose, the critical text of the, the Greek uh, Bible, because there's a lot of, of horrible manuscripts in that text. And uh, it uses the receive text. So that's why I use it. So, so every now and then we'll have to go and look up a word. What does sundry mean? Uh, well, sundry times just meant different time periods. So in different time periods, 
Okay, God, who at different time periods and in divers' manners, that just means various ways, so in different times and different ways, spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets. This is, God, God did things differently back then. Okay, that's just kind of a simple way to, to look at that verse. Hath in these last days, so now we're, we're in the, the days that we're living in, spoken unto us by what? His son. Basically, the New Testament gives us the full revelation of God. Why? Because we know all about the son of God, Jesus. Okay? So you see dispensationalism in this verse. Uh, that God operated differently in different time periods. That's really what, what that word means. Is that God... God uh, communicated, God uh, uh, worked with humans differently in different time periods as he does today. And then Hebrews 1, 2 says, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. Okay, now, we're not gonna take time here, but we could take this line and jump back to Genesis 1, right? Do you see how, you see the connection point? Now, he made the world, so well, what does that mean? Well, let's go back and let's read all about that. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Okay, so God worked differently in various different times and different ways in human history. So what we're going to try to do is give you, oh, by the way, let me say one thing about this. When we talk about dispensations, we're not saying that salvation was different in different times. God, God's plan of salvation was consistently the same throughout all of human history. It's always been by grace that you're saved through faith. It's not of ourselves. It's a gift of God. You say, well, wait a second. How could you put your faith in Jesus, dying on the cross and rising again if you lived before he lived? Well, obviously, they wouldn't know all the details, but we do know that Abraham believed God and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Some people say Abraham was saved when he went to offer Isaac. Now, some of you are pretty new to Christianity. You don't even know what that is. That's why we're doing is the Old Testament obsolete. We're going to talk about Abraham going, being willing to offer his son of promise. He's in his old age. His wife's in her old age. There's no way humanly possible they're going to have a son, but God had promised it. God had promised it. God had promised it. Does God keep his promises? Absolutely. If it's an unconditional promise, God will keep that. And God says, okay, now go sacrifice Isaac. What? Well, I tell you, Abraham's faith was amazing at that moment because he was going to go do it. God had never wanted that. God does, does not want human sacrifice. Of course, he did sacrifice his son. That shows how incredible God is. But there was Abraham, an old man. Isaac was probably a strong teenager, and Isaac was willing to do this as well. And he's about to come down with the knife, and suddenly there's an angel that stops Abraham, and there in the thicket was caught, caught a ram. And Abraham called that Jehovah Jireh, which means God will provide. God hath provided himself a lamb, a ram. And so, a beautiful story of Abraham's faith. And they say, well, that's when Abraham got saved. No, no, no. The, the, the scripture tells us that he got saved when he believed God, when he was willing to leave Ur, way before Isaac. So his salvation was way, way before Isaac. He was actually not even called Abraham. He was called Abram. And so you see here, salvation is always the same. Adam and Eve needed to be saved. How can they be saved? Well, here's what they did. They believed that one day God would provide a sacrifice that would be a sacrifice for their sins. They trusted in that. We today look back to the cross, then they looked forward to the cross. They didn't know the details, they didn't know everything, but throughout scripture, Genesis 3.15 and on, there's a promise of a deliverer, of a Messiah, and they put their faith in the Lord. Now we know all the details of that. But the way of salvation is always the same across every dispensation. But the way that God worked with people differed in different dispensations. Here's how I know this. If you don't believe in dispensations, I noticed that you did not walk into church today with a lamb. 
I've noticed that. So that actually does mean you're a dispensationalist. Okay? Why? Because at one point in human history, God did require for fellowship his people bringing a lamb into the tabernacle or the temple to sacrifice. That was the way he operated. He's not operating that way today. Let me try to put it in this, uh, in this story. Let's say you're at work. You've been working at the same job for about 10 years. You've gotten to know your boss pretty good. You know what they expect. You know what they want. You know kind of their quirks. And so you're, you're used to that. And your, your boss is very you know, punctual. You better be exactly on time to the staff meeting. The staff meeting is always on this day. He wants the projects filed a certain way and done this, all these different things. And you're, and you're used to the way he works. And then he takes a new job and you have a new boss. Now, this boss cares more about the ultimate job. Did you, did it, did everything get done? He's not as worried about tracking your hours or that you have to, you know, do all of these things in the exact way. He's just looking at the big picture. Now, both, both ways can work, but it's hard for the employee that's used to the boss operating in one way to suddenly switch to the boss operating in a different way, a new boss. Or, or think of it this way. Let's say you, you're very wealthy and you have a huge house and you hire help in your house. And every morning, that person uh, knows that you like to wake up to sunlight and you're an early riser and you want that coffee and you want your cream a certain way and you want it, everything, you, you have a certain way that you like it and that person that's working for you knows that and so every morning the, the drapes are open, the coffee is made and it's, it's everything exactly the way they like it. And then he dies and now the son is in charge of the household and the son likes to sleep in. The sun doesn't like the sun in the morning streaming in through the windows. The sun doesn't like coffee. Imagine that's such a horrible thing. The sun prefers tea around 10 o'clock. So the first day with this new person, you throw open the windows and the, the curtains and the, the light streams in and, and you have the coffee ready and he's not very happy with you. He... It works differently in different times, in different ways. And it's not a way of salvation, but it's just a way of that God was working with, with humanity. You say, well, why, why, would, why would God work differently? Well, there's a big picture here. I'm going to give that to you at the end. But it's, it's just simply this. God was showing us our weakness and our failure all along the way. And at the end, we're going to see the, the succession and why God operated differently in different times. Okay, so let me show you dispensations. Here are seven dispensations. You see the chart. Uh, you have a list of these. We would start in what we call eternity past. And we come in the, to the first dispensation. We would call that the, the, the age of innocence. This was really a pretty short amount of time. It only lasted until Genesis chapter 3, verse 7. And I would call this creation to sin. This, the age of innocence. Things were simple. It was a beautiful garden. You didn't have to worry about what outfit you wore that day. All you had to do was worry about not eating one tree and you got to fellowship with God. That was the whole point of creating us, that, that Adam and Eve walked in the cool of the day with God. The sweet fellowship, that's why we were created. That's our purpose, the age of innocence. And then that ended with sin. The sin of Adam, the sin of Eve, cast out of the garden. And then we entered into an age that we call the age of conscience, where now we know wrong and now because we've now we've we've experienced sin and now now we know right and wrong and and God operated that way until around the flood after the flood we find another dispensation the dispensation of human government and by the way that 
that dispensation does continue in, in a certain way, but it's not the main theme today, but that was the main theme then. After the flood, Noah and his family, God instituted certain things like corporal pun- or death, the, the death penalty. Okay? And so we, we find that, that age, and that lasted until uh, basically the end of the story of the Tower of, of Babel in Genesis 11, and then in Genesis 12, we enter into this dispensation called promise. By the way, all of these first five were, are basically Old Testament, okay? And in the age of the promise, in Genesis 12, through pretty much Exodus, Moses, you could actually make a point to where it ended right at Sinai when God gave the next dispensation, but either way, around then, from Abraham to Moses, you have this, this, this age of promise where, where God promised Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and their descendants a, a Savior would come from them and that they would bring us the scriptures and they would bless the whole world and their descendants would be as the sand of the sea. These were unconditional promises of God. And by the way, that was to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to the Jewish people, God keeps his promises. And that will... And in dispensationalism, uh, one of the main features of dispensationalism is that the promises God made to Israel are specific to the nation of Israel, and once they receive Yeshua, Messiah, as their Savior nationally, uh, God will continue to fulfill the promises made to them. The church, in other words, the church does not replace Israel. We are not replacement theologists here at Quint Road. We believe that God, and in, in, I mean Romans 9 through 11, and many other places, that, that God will fulfill his promises to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And then we enter into this time, what we call the, the age of the law, the dispensation of law. And that's pretty easy, right? Ten Commandments, uh, tabernacle, worship, uh, you know, all of these feasts and, and all of these things. This is very complicated, not just ten. But, but literally hundreds of laws that are given, and they're given for, the Ten Commandments, by the way, are, are other than keeping the Sabbath, are for all of us um, across, across dispensations. I think it was just codified at that time. You know, you don't kill, you don't steal. These are things that we all know are wrong, okay? But the, the way that God was operating with the nation of Israel at that time was an, a way that he had a lot of, of laws, and it was God leading a nation, God leading a people. And then all of that ended when Jesus came and died on the cross. And then we have this dispensation that we're in today, what we, some call the dispensation of grace. I don't like calling it that because all dispensations are dispensations of grace. I like to call it the dispensation of the church, the age of the church. We're not male, female. No, we're not Jew or Gentile. We're not bond or free. We're all one in Christ Jesus. And this is a wonderful time to be alive. That will end at the rapture of the church. Um, by the way, law will continue back under uh, the tribulation period. And then all of that will end and we enter into the seventh and final dispensation of human history, God relating to man, and that is in the millennial reign of Jesus Christ on the earth. And that will last a thousand years, and then we enter what we would call eternity future. So that's dispensationalism. All of these are under the Old Testament, and then we have uh, the church age in the New Testament. All right. Under each of those dispensations, we see a pattern, and and. Every pattern goes like this. God gives man a responsibility. We fail. A judgment comes. And then God gives grace to move on. That's, if you look at every dispensation that we just outlined, that's the pattern that you will see. So a question that this series, Is the Old Testament Obsolete, is going to answer for you is this. How does the church, how do we today relate to the prior dispensations? How, how do we relate to the law? How do we relate to innocence, conscience, human government? How, how does that affect us? What, what do we need to know or not know about the Hebrew Scriptures? And again, be careful to not overemphasize the Old Testament, but we need to know it. 
The big point is, is, is we, if we don't know the Old Testament, we're gonna miss a lot of truth that God wants you to know, and that will help you, okay? So here's an example of how we're gonna do this series. We're gonna come to a, a New Testament passage. In my instance, it's John 1, 1, look at that one. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So we read that in the first verse of the Gospel of John. In the beginning. By, by the way, does this sound familiar to you? If you know the Old Testament, the very first book, the very first words, very similar. As a matter of fact, John 1, 2 tells us that the same was in the beginning with God. In other words, the, the word, capital W, Logos, let's go back. There we go. It's, I can't go back. You know what? This thing is obsolete. There it goes. Okay. Yeah, if we, uh, if, if we wanted to help Microsoft get better at PowerPoint, I've got a lot of suggestions that will help them. Okay. In the beginning was the Word. See that? That's the capital, so that's Logos. Okay? So you have the Word, which we know later is Jesus. The Son is the Logos, the Word. And the Word was with God. The Word was God. So isn't that interesting? You see the dynamic of the Trinity there, don't you? The Trinity, by the way, is in the Old Testament as well. It's a little more veiled, but it's there. And then in, the same was in the beginning with God. So the Logos, Jesus, the Son of God, was in the beginning, and it says all things were made by him. So we're, we're getting some more light on Genesis, aren't we? So that's what the New Testament does. It gives us a fuller understanding of what we learned in the Old Testament, in the Hebrew Scriptures. Here's a, a perfect example. All things were made by him. That means that the second person of the Trinity was the one that was active in creation. We're, we're, we're learning more from the illumination of the, of the New Testament, and that's what Jesus does. He gives us more to work with. He, he helps us understand things fully. And without him was not anything made that was made. So if we read that in John 1, how would we know what that was without knowing what the Old Testament says? Well, let's jump over to Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the water. So by the way, you see the Spirit, right? You see the Spirit. And God said, let us... It's singular but yet plural in the Hebrew. Singular but yet plural. How is that possible? One God, three persons. God said, let there be light, and there was light. By the way, remember back in the New Testament, we learn about Jesus is the light of the world, right? So you, you, you now, we're now illuminating more details about God. Of course, Jesus is the ultimate illumination of what God is like. And then God saw the light, that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness. And we continue on to read about the first day of creation. How would we know any of that without knowing the Old Testament, right? Is the Old Testament obsolete? Is it? No, it is not. You're never sure if I'm rhetorical or asking a real question. I'm usually asking a real question when I'm expecting a real answer, but you're not sure when I'm expecting a real answer either. Okay. All right, now how would you possibly know Hebrews 11? Go look at Hebrews 11, and we, we call this the, the faith chapter or the hall of faith, hall of fame. What is, and so Hebrews obviously is a, a New Testament book. It was written to primarily Jewish believers but it, it has a lot of the references of the Old Testament in this book. The Gospels have quite a few. Acts, of course. Revelation has a ton. But Hebrews has a lot of Old Testament um, references back to either the, the allusion or the actual quotation. But here in Hebrews 11.4, by faith, Abel. Okay? Now, if you didn't know the, the Old Testament, you'd be like, Abel? Who's this Abel? Okay, you wouldn't know. You wouldn't know. 
The only way that you would know is if you were to go back and study Genesis 4. We're not going to take the time to, to actually go back and do that now, but we will in this series. By faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. Who's Cain? Again, you wouldn't know that unless you study the Old Testament. You study Genesis chapter 4. So we know that there's this Abel, there's this Cain, that Abel offered a better sacrifice. What was that? Well, we know because we read it in Genesis chapter 4. By which he obtained witness that he was righteous. By the way, that's the whole point of the book of James. Some people look at James, and some people look at Romans, and Romans says that we're justified by faith without the deeds of the law, and then James seems to suggest that we're justified by works, right? So how do you understand those two? Again, understanding that salvation's always by grace, it's never by works. We're not justified before God by our works, but our works are what show the world our faith. It's how we demonstrate that we have faith in God. In other words, when, when Abraham went to offer Isaac, he was demonstrating his faith, which happened years earlier in Ur, to the world in a profound way. We still read about it. We still study it today. So it's always by faith that we're saved, but the way that we show the world our faith is by what we do. So there's a, one of these two are righteous, and it's not because he offered a better sacrifice, but he, he believed God. He believed God. So here we have God testifying of his gifts, and by it being dead yet speaketh. So we know a little bit more about Cain and Abel from Hebrews, and that is one of them died, right? So again, how would you know how he died? Well, we know in Genesis 4, that there were two brothers, and they were sons of Adam and Eve, and one brought the, the proper sacrifice. The sacrifice was uh, an animal sacrifice, a blood sacrifice, and the other brought a, a sacrifice from the earth. In other words, one was a, a blood sacrifice that pointed to the coming future blood sacrifice of Christ. Without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sins. The other one brought his works. His, his plants, his vegetables. And I'm sure it was a great offering, but it wasn't what God had asked for, okay? But you wouldn't know any of that unless you had studied Genesis. Genesis, by the way, if you don't know Genesis, you, you're not gonna get the scriptures. The people that minimize Genesis, that they say we evolved, and you know, instead of six days, it was six long periods of time, they've just uh, basically broken the Bible. Okay? When, you, when you doubt the first verses of the Bible, how can you possibly respect any of the other ones? No. There's actually tons of evidence that we were created, and it was not that long ago. Tons of evidence. So who is Abel? Who is Cain? You would need to go back to Genesis and read about them. And then the next verse in Hebrews 11, by faith, Enoch. Okay, so now we have another name that, if you don't know the Old Testament, you have no idea who this guy is. Who's Enoch? But now Hebrews tells us that he was translated that he should not see death. So we find an example of someone that is living and God takes him alive. You know what that sounds like to me? That sounds like the rapture of the church. It's certainly a, a precursor to the rapture. Somebody that's alive doesn't see death. Wouldn't that be wonderful? I'm not afraid of death because I'm saved, I'm on my way to heaven, because I put my trust in Jesus Christ. I'm not looking forward to dying. Would y'all pray that it's just like painless and fast and everything? So, but, but, but there's gonna be a group of people that don't have to face death. And Enoch, and there was another person in the Old Testament that also was translated. So we know Enoch was translated, we don't know anything more about him unless we were to study the Old Testament, right? And we would read that in Genesis 5. In 22 through 24, I, that's your homework. That's what I want you to do is uh, to study up about Enoch. But that's what we're going to be doing in this series. Who is this Enoch? And let's learn the story. Let's learn what happened. Somebody said he went for a walk, a long walk, and 
And uh, he was one that walked with God, and then he was not. He never came home from that long walk. God translated him. For before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. And then we come to the next verse in Hebrews 11, verse 6. Without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is the rewarder of them that diligently seek him. So these, these passages in the New Testament really help us understand faith, but in order to understand the detail of these stories, the important parts of these stories, we need to go back and reference the Old Testament. Hebrews 7, uh, 11, 7 says, by faith Noah. Now, most people know who Noah is. Some of those most popular in grace episodes that we do is about Noah, the flood, and the ark. I mean, everybody is interested in that. I got a uh, text today from one of the founders of Answers in Genesis, and they said, watch Fox News this morning because one of their reporters is going to come bring her kids to the ark. And, and they did, and I watched it. It was really neat. Some of you uh, need to, all of you need to go and see that. But, but who is this Noah being warned of God, of things not seen as of yet, moved with fear, preparing an ark to the saving of his house? by the which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is by faith. How would you know anything about Noah unless you read Genesis 6 through 10? You see how important the Old Testament is to us today? To help us understand more detail about what God is trying to teach us here. The authors of the New Testament were quoting or alluding to the Old Testament assuming that you know what it is. Do you? This is not just Sunday school material. The Old Testament is important to everyday Christian life. By faith, Abraham in Hebrews 11, 8. We did a, a series, an In Grace two-part series on, on faith. And we actually went through this passage with the Murray family. And we went out to Big Sky and we skied and we saw this uh, ice waterfall. And it's just a beautiful place. We took a snowmobile. Uh, to Old Faithful in the middle of winter. And uh, we, we, we talked about faith. And all these incredible characters, real people, that you'll be able to meet, by the way. Uh, I want to go talk to Abraham and find out a little bit more about what it was like and all the things that he did. By faith, when he was called to go out of a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, obeyed, and he went out not knowing whether he went. How would you know about Abraham unless you read Genesis 11 through 25? Do you see what I'm trying to say here? Is my point getting across? And then if you were to continue to read in Hebrews 11, you're going to read about other people like Sarah, Isaac, Jacob, Esau, Joseph, Moses, Rahab, Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, the prophets. How do you know about those people unless you read the Hebrew Scriptures? Okay. I was once in Poland, and we were filming a series on the Holocaust, and we had been to Auschwitz. This uh, cab driver had picked Karen and I up, and we were driving through the streets heading to, uh, I think, Krakow uh, to, uh, to fly to the next destination. And he knew English, and so we started to talk, and, and he said, yeah, uh, it seems to me like the New Testament God is like my mom. She was nice. She always let us get away with stuff. And is this resonating with some of you? And the Old Testament God was like my dad. He was mean. He disciplined us. He never let us do what we wanted to do. Is that the proper understanding of God? There's one God in the New Testament, one God in the Old Testament. I started to think that's more like uh, the God of the New Testament is like grandparents. <laughs> The God of the Old Testament's like parents. No, that, both of those things are wrong. That's not, so God is the same. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. You say, well, why did he operate a little differently then? Well, because he was, again, trying to show us that we've messed up, that we failed, that we cannot do it right on our own, and that we have to rely on him. That's the story of Scripture. That's the story of the entire Bible. God had to show us that even with a system of laws and sacrifices, we would always fall short. But then Jesus came. And he did what we could not do. And the only thing left for us in the church age is to rely on Jesus living 
through us by his spirit. I got an email this morning from a member of our church who is incarcerated. But I told him, I said, Charlie, you're a missionary because he's gotten right with the Lord. He's done great for years after what he did wrong. He's serving time for what he did wrong. But he emailed and he's he's just telling me, I said, Charlie, you're a missionary now from our church. You're gonna be a missionary. And, And he's led lots of people to Christ. But this is what he said today. He said, Pastor, this is hard. He's in the uh, Illinois River Correctional Facility. Lots of gang members. He said a lot more, but I'm just giving you the small stuff. He said, John chapter three helped me a lot yesterday. He said, I read it to my cellmate. And he was able to help his cellmate understand eternal security. He said this, he said, Jesus Christ is so amazing, exclamation point. I love him so much. That's the Christian life that we, we now understand and we now know, and that's the only way to live. In all of these other times in human history, we've failed. The only person that's ever able to succeed was Jesus, God in the flesh. He lived the way we couldn't live, and if we will, first of all, put our trust in him and be saved from our sins, but then understand that the only way we're going to live the right way that God wants us to live and the, the way that will bless other people is to live by loving him and allowing him to live through us by the Spirit of God. That's what the New Testament is all about. You say, then why do we know, need to know the Old Testament? I've just explained that to you. You want me to start over in the sermon? You're like, no, 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 don't do that. But I was blessed by Charlie's email, the simple sentence, I love Jesus Christ so much. I love him so much. So let's do one more as we close. John 3. In verse 14, Jesus says to Nicodemus, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, by the way, Charlie had no idea this was in my sermon today, and this is what blessed him. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. What? If you don't know the Old Testament, what in the world does this mean? Well, that's again why you need to know the Old Testament. There was an incredible story. This was when the children of Israel had been released from Egypt. They had crossed the Red Sea. They had been to Mount Sinai. And now they're eventually going to end up in the land of Israel that God had promised. It says in Numbers 21.4, they journeyed from the Mount Mount Hor by the way of the Red Sea to come past the land of Edom and the soul of the people was much discouraged because of the way. Do you know sometimes life is hard? A lot of times life is hard. What do you do when life is hard? Well, don't do what they did. The people spake against God and against Moses. Wherefore have ye brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? Can you imagine saying that? After seeing the Red Sea part? After seeing God give water out of a rock, and after seeing God uh, uh, springing up this delicious bread from the desert, I mean, you're seeing God in, in real time, in real life, working in incredible ways, and then you would say this? Is this the reason God and Moses brought us out of Egypt? Do you think Egypt was a good life? How would you know if you don't know the Old Testament? Egypt wasn't a good life. They were slaves. It was a horrible life. God is bringing them out of that to this incredible place of prosperity and peace, and they're complaining because it's hard. For there is no bread, neither is there any water, and our soul loathes this light bread. Now listen, I know if we ate the same thing every day, you'd get sick of it. If I gave you filet mignon and lobster tail, you probably after two weeks would start complaining. Believe me, I might too. I don't know. But they had this incredible provision of God and they were complaining. So what happened? Well, the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people and they bit the people and much people of Israel died. You say, well, that's the Old Testament God. He's mean, right? No, God is God. God is God. He's right, he's gracious, he's good. But there's a limit, folks. There's a limit. You need to have reverence for God. He is God. And then... Therefore the people came to Moses and said, we have sinned, we have spoken against the Lord and against thee. Pray unto the Lord. And I would have said no. Sorry. You complained about me. 
you're going to have to live with the consequences. Whew. I'm like the God of the Old Testament, right? I'm kind of mean. And that, that, that God would take away the serpents from us. And Moses did it. God bless Moses. Go, Moses prayed for the people. Verse 8, the Lord said unto Moses, make thee a fiery serpent. Okay. Now all of a sudden, what Jesus just said to Nicodemus, hundreds and hundreds of years later, is starting to make sense to me. And so now this, here, here's Moses, here's a fiery serpent, to make one and set it upon a pole, and it, and it shall come to pass that everyone that is, that is bitten, when he looketh upon it, shall live. What? what? That is the strangest thing I've ever heard. Well, you know what God was doing? God was painting a picture. A serpent made out of bronze on a pole. That serpent had no venom, it, but it represented venom. It represented sin. It represented us complaining. It represented us stealing and cheating and hating. And that, that serpent on a pole, everyone that would look upon that would be healed. So what saved those people? Was it their religion? Was it their priest? No, it was their faith. They looked and they lived. So Jesus says, even as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, why did God do that? Why did God tell Moses to do that? Why did Moses do that? To show us what was going to come. Jesus is going to be lifted up on a tree. He's not a serpent. Serpent represented sin. Remember, the serpent was in the Garden of Eden. Jesus had no venom, had no sin, but he was made sin for us. And anyone who by faith looks upon him, not upon their religion, not upon their pastor or priest, but upon him and him alone, is saved. He will live. And Moses made a serpent of brass and put it upon a pole, and it came to pass, if a serpent had, if a serpent had bitten any man, when he beheld the serpent of brass, he lived. So how would you know anything about what Jesus had just told Nicodemus unless you knew this episode from Numbers? Do you understand that we need the Old Testament? Is the Old Testament obsolete? It is not. Is Jesus the only answer? Absolutely. He's the only answer. We've tried it every other way. We failed every time. But because Jesus came and died and rose again, we can be saved from our sins. The Bible says that we're all sinners. This is us on my left hand. This um, phone is sin. We've all sinned. Jesus had no sin. My right hand is Jesus, but he was made sin for us. He was on the cross. He had no sin, but he took upon himself our sin when he died, and he rose again. By the way, how do we know Jesus was God, for sure, in the flesh? He rose again. It is all about Jesus and the resurrection, but don't minimize the Old Testament, because you wouldn't know a lot of these truths that we know. Could you, live, could you live without the Old Testament? Sure, you can live without it. But should you live without it? Absolutely not. So Jesus came, and he died for our sins, and if you will, by faith, put your trust in him, look what happens. You have everlasting life. You're healed from the venom of sin. The penalty of sin is death. That's eternal separation from God in hell. That's called the second death. If you've been born twice, Nicodemus, you must be born again. How can I be born when I'm old? Can I enter a second time into my mother's womb and be born? Of course not. He's talking about a spiritual rebirth. And when you put your faith in Christ, you're born again. And once you're born, you're born. You're, you cannot be unborn. Look, if you let go, he has you in his hand. That's the wonderful truth of Jesus, is he saves you not just for today and tomorrow, he saves you for forever. Isn't that wonderful? Have you put your faith in Jesus? God loved the world so much that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him, trusts in him, should not perish but have everlasting life. It's by grace that you're saved through what? Faith, it's not of yourselves, it's a gift of God. It's not of works lest any man should boast. Do you know Christ, have you been saved? You can know him. You can be saved today by just believing that Jesus died for you and rose again, paid for your sins. And when you believe that, the Bible says that you are a child of his. And that's a wonderful thing. Would you please uh, close your eyes and bow your heads as we're about to pray? Before we pray, though, let me just speak to you. Do you remember a time when you've made that decision? If you don't, do it today. Do not leave this place. 
Do it right now. Say, Lord, I'm a sinner. He can read your thoughts. I can't save myself, but right now I put my trust in Jesus. I believe that Jesus is the Son of God who died for my sins on the cross, who rose again. I trust in him and him alone. If you're doing that today, I would love to know about it. Would you raise your hand? Today, I've trusted Jesus Christ as my Savior. Hold it up for a moment for me. I won't embarrass you. Just hold it up. Say, Pastor Scudder, today I've made that decision. I wasn't sure when I walked in here how to get to heaven, but I just heard the gospel explained. The whole Bible comes down to the gospel in John 3, 16. And I just re received that. I just believed in him. Is there someone in here today that has made that decision? Hold up your hand for just a moment. Maybe you're watching or listening. Have you made that decision? Please let us know if you have. Lord, how grateful we are that you are the same yesterday, today, and forever. That Jesus did come and fulfill the law and the prophets. All of those different dispensations were good. We just failed it. And Lord, the final way that you can relate is by us walking in the Spirit every day. We don't have to bring the sacrifices. We don't have to, to bring a lamb to church because Jesus is that final, ultimate sacrifice. When he said it is finished, it is finished. Lord, help us to, to learn more about your word. Help us to learn more about all these incredible things that we can be taught in the Hebrew scriptures. Lord, we ask a blessing upon this study. And Lord, help us to every day, Lord, make sure that we have that excitement, that love, the relationship with you, with Jesus. As Charlie uh, explained today, that he just, he's in a hard situation, but he just loves Jesus. Lord, help us to all to do that more and more. In the precious name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.